the mind can be a source of great energy if you train it well. You've probably noticed that some people seem to radiate energy, and it's not just physical energy. There's a metal, spiritual quality to it. Other people are energy sinks. They walk into a room and they suck all the energy out of the air. It all comes down to how you handle things going on in your mind, which means that if you train your mind well, you can be a source of good energy too, both for yourself and for the people around you. And John Lee talks about this in one of his last Dharma talks, Crossing the Ocean of Life. There's the energy of goodwill. which people can pick up if you have any karmic connection. The people who have helped you in the past, you can help them through the energy of your mind when it's well trained. He makes the point, though, that if you're going to be spreading thoughts of goodwill, it has to come out of a sense of well-being inside. This comparison is opening a faucet of and if there's water coming out of the faucet, it's cool in one way. If it's just a lot of wind coming out of the faucet, it's cool in another way. You want to be the faucet with water. So you create that by how you relate to yourself inside. You relate to yourself with goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. And you can learn this by how you relate to the breath. We're here to become friends with the breath. You want to be an admirable friend to your breath, not one of those false friends that, that are described in that chant that we chant every now and then. You want to look after the breath. Well, the breath needs care. If you don't pay attention to it, it'll come in and go out, but sometimes in good ways, sometimes in ways that are not so good. You want to learn how to be sensitive to when the breath is good and to when it's not. And when it's not good, you figure out how you can make it better. When it is good, you want to learn how to protect it. That means as you get used to which qualities in your mind help make the breath good and help protect it, protect it. you want to protect those qualities as well. This is how the mind starts to increase generate good energy. So goodwill for the breath means that you want it to be comfortable. Compassion for the breath is when you notice it's not comfortable and you do your best to figure out ways to make it more comfortable. You start with the in and out breath, figure out what rhythm of breathing feels good. And if things aren't so good, well, is it because the breath is too short, too shallow, too long, too deep, too heavy, too light? You work at improving it and trying to figure out what's the problem. Sometimes the problem is with the physical elements in the body. Sometimes it's with the mind. So you make a survey. Try to figure out what the cause is. To figure out what the cause is. As for when the breath is going well, you try not to be complacent. Do your best to keep it going well and to figure out ways to make it better. Because you find as the mind settles down into different layers of concentration, different levels of concentration, that the way you experience the breath is going to change. When you get the mind in the first jhana, there's a sense of the breath energy suffusing throughout the body. But you're standing outside of it a little bit, watching over. like the bathman or the bathman's apprentice in the Buddha's image. In the second jhana, you're in the breath. It surrounds you, and there's a sense of upwelling energy inside, and you want to learn how to keep it coming up. As the image in the canon says, the skies provide abundant showers time and again. And you try to figure out what's the quality of the mind that keeps that energy flowing up in the body. 
How do you protect that? How do you keep it in balance so you don't, don't just run right over it or tip it over? With the third jhana, there's a sense of greater stillness in the breath. That upwelling energy only dissipates. And John Lee's image is a nice one. It's like an ice cube. And there's a little bit of vapor coming off the ice cube. Inside, things seem to be pretty still, and they get more and more connected so that if there's a lack of breath energy in one part of the body, you can connect it up immediately to a part where there may be an excess, so things balance out, balance out, balance out all around the body, all through the body. That leads you to the point where the breath finally stops. Now, there are different ways the breath can stop. Sometimes you're suppressing it, which you don't want to do. Just give a little order to the body that if you need to breathe, go ahead and breathe. But if you don't need to breathe, well, just sit right here and be very still. It's important that when you reach this stage that your awareness fill the entire body. You take the body as this range of still energy as your object and learn how to protect it. This is empathetic joy. You have empathetic joy both for the causes that you're creating by the way you focus and the results. And then there's equanimity for the breath. This can mean two things. One is that when you've tried your hardest to get certain parts of the body to get connected to good breath energy, to take part in the the general sense of well-being in the body, but you find that you can't do it. There are some parts of the body that resist, and the more you try to work them into the general well-being of the body, the more they resist. And there's usually a psychological reason to go along with a physical reason, which means this is going to take time. So as with any skittish animal, you don't focus too much attention on it, those parts. You're aware of the animal, you look at it out of the corner of your eye. But otherwise, you're just going to leave it alone in hopes that at some point it'll start trusting you, and then it'll begin to open up. There are certain parts of your mind that are closed off to you for one reason or another. And so take some patience and some equanimity to allow them just to be for a while as you work on other parts of the body. And then when there's a sense of trust inside, it'll begin to open up. That's one kind of equanimity. Another kind of equanimity comes when the breath is totally still, the mind is still with the breath, and you don't need to push anything in any way at all. Then you just let things be. Now you look after them, you tend to them so that they stay in that balanced state. But you're not excited about it, you're not worked up about it, it's just there. It comes to be your normalcy. So by the way you relate to the breath, you learn some important lessons about how to relate to other parts of your mind and how to relate to other people. You create this good energy starting with the breath, and then it radiates out from there. Goodwill for yourself, goodwill for others. In other words, a wish for true happiness. Compassion if you see people who are suffering or see people who are doing things that are going to lead to suffering down the line. In other words, they're creating bad karma. You've got to have compassion for them. Do what you can to alleviate their current suffering, and if you can find some way to get them to stop, some skillful way to get them to stop doing unskillful things. You try it. Mudita, empathetic joy, that's the one of the four Brahma Viharas. That's the one that tends to get the least attention, because we feel if people are happy already, they don't need us. But that's not the case. 
is one. Empathetic joy means not only being happy for people who are happy, but you're also happy for people who are doing good things. And they need encouragement sometime. So do what you can to encourage them. As for people who are happy already, it's important that you not develop jealousy or resentment. Because if those qualities show up in your mind, you're going to have that problem someday, too. When you're happy, other people will resent your happiness. Do you want that? No. And you realize that we all have our good periods and our bad periods. As the Buddha said, when you see someone who's really suffering a lot, you have to remind yourself, you've been there. You see someone who's extremely wealthy and endowed with all kinds of pleasures. You've been there, too. This way you realize that we're all in this together. And when you're being compassionate, you're not stooping down to help the people below you. And when you're happy for other people are happy, you're not dealing with people who are above you. You're, we're all on the same level. As for equanimity, there are times you realize there you tried to help and it just doesn't work. It has to do either with your past karma or other people's past karma. And so you put the matter aside for the time being and focus on areas where you can be of help. And keep an eye out for the time when the conditions may change and you can be of help in this other situation. Now these attitudes can be developed as you're actively interacting with other people. But you can also develop them here as you're meditating. Remember, you're generating these good qualities just by the way you relate to the breath. And you can dedicate this to others. Either specific people you know are suffering right now or all living beings in all directions. Because your mind is now generating good energy. It's like being a radio station. You don't know who has the radio turned on. You don't know who has it tuned to your channel. But you just keep on broadcasting. Create the energy and think of it spreading out in all directions. That actually improves the quality of your concentration. At the same time that it improves the quality of the energy around you. Some people can pick it up immediately. Other people will take a while. Some people can't pick it up at all. But again, you have no control over that. You're the radio station. You're not the monitor of all the radios in San Diego. So try to generate good energy while you're here. Relate to the breath in a good way. Relate to the events in your mind in a good way. And you automatically create a good energy field.